Okay, good morning, and can I welcome everyone to the 13th meeting of 2014 of the Public Audit Committee? Um, and can I welcome the Auditor General, uh, Gordon Smale, and Angela Cullen from Audit Scotland? Um, item one, can we agree to take item five in private? Okay, thank you. Item two, we have a section 23 report, Scotland's public finances, uh, a follow up audit uh, and progress in meeting the challenges. Um, can I invite the Auditor General to brief the committee? <coughs> Thank you. The report I'm bringing before the committee today is the third in a series of reports on Scotland's public finances, and it's a follow up of our 2011 report, which was focused on addressing the challenges. The report provides a high level update on the financial position of the public sector since then and comments on how bodies right across the public sector are meeting the challenges of reduced public spending. The report is aimed at public bodies, including NHS boards and central government bodies, and raises a range of important issues for those involved in scrutinising public finances, including non-executive directors, chief executives and other board members. The challenges of increasing demand and cost pressures have been evident for some time now and have been a constant theme in reports brought before this committee in recent years. Almost three years on from our last update, finances remain tight and most public bodies anticipate further budget reductions in the years ahead. This, combined with an ageing population, changes to the welfare system and the need to provide and maintain public assets like hospitals and prisons, provide just a few examples of the continuing pressures that public bodies face today. During 2013, the auditors of 67 public bodies examined and reported on how those bodies are meeting the challenges of these budget reductions. My report provides a high-level summary of the main themes coming from this work and identifies what more needs to be done. It provides the context for the sector-specific checklists we've published alongside the report, which are aimed at supporting awareness and improvement. The report emphasises the importance of focusing on priorities when setting budgets, of long-term financial planning and of the key role of non-exec directors in ensuring that bodies are well positioned to deliver quality services for less money. Since 2009-10, the Scottish Departmental Expenditure Limit Budget has fallen 9% in real terms to just under £29 billion in 2014-15. Public bodies have coped well so far with these reductions, mainly through reducing staff costs. But with further reductions expected, measures like that aren't sustainable, and public bodies face increasingly difficult choices in reducing spending while maintaining quality and meeting rising demand. To help manage these challenges, public bodies need to focus more on their priorities when they're setting their budgets, making clearer connections between what they plan to spend and the outcomes they're trying to achieve. Rigorous use of options appraisal based on good information is required for effective budget-related decisions and for making those decisions clear and understood to the communities that public bodies serve. We found there's limited evidence of longer-term financial planning. Although funding allocations from the Scottish Government typically cover one to three year spending review periods, this shouldn't prevent public bodies from assessing their spending needs and options over a longer term, and more work is needed to develop and regularly review those longer term financial strategies, which reflect priorities, risks and liabilities, and their implications for affordability. My report also emphasises the crucial role played by non-executive directors in ensuring public bodies are well positioned to deliver quality services with less money. This involves approving budgets and holding people to account for how the money is spent and what outcomes are achieved. We found that public bodies do need to improve the quality of the information provided to non-executive directors and others involved in scrutiny to help them in this role. Finally, convener, the report makes three recommendations aimed at helping public bodies to plan more effectively to deal with the challenges. First of all, we think that public bodies should impl implement an approach to budgeting that focuses on priorities and links their spending plans more closely to the outcomes they want to achieve. Secondly, public bodies need to develop a longer-term approach to financial planning that takes account, account of the risks and liabilities they face and provides assurances about long-term aff affordability. And thirdly, they need to improve the information provided to support the scrutiny and challenge of spending decisions. Effective scrutiny requires information that's reliable, relevant and timely. We've published sector-specific checklists that are aimed at non-executive directors to help promote good practice and scrutiny when setting the 2015-16 budgets and beyond. 
The checklists are designed to help non-exec directors with their important role in budget setting and in overseeing financial plans and financial performance. They can also provide a basis for discussion in public bodies on budget setting, long-term financial planning and the information that's needed to support effective scrutiny of the public finances. Convener, as always, my colleagues and I will be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you for that. Um, can I refer you to paragraph 24 in your report? You say that funding for central government bodies will increase in 2015-16. Uh, will local government see an increase in that year as well? I'm going to ask Angela to respond yeah. to that. Um, in the previous uh, couple of paragraphs, in 22 and 23, we talk about health and local government. So actually in paragraph 23, local government budget um, from the government is, like, uh, is due to decrease by 1% in 1516, as yeah. is the health service. So central government bodies will see an increase, but local government, which delivers the services, will actually see a decrease. Is that right? That's right. Right. So what, what we see here is more pressure on those that are actually delivering the services uh, in some respect than on those who are kind of planning and coordinating at uh, a central government level. Now, I, I don't know about other members, but I certainly know in my area, you know, councils, uh, the councils really, two councils are struggling to maintain services at the, the current level. Um, and I'm not sure how, you know, how much longer that can go on without starting to impact on, on quality. But, can I just so, break in briefly there to say it's slightly more complicated than that because of the um, fact that not all central government bodies are bodies that aren't providing frontline services. So, for example, Police Scotland and the SPA, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, are now classed as um, central government right, bodies. Okay. So there are bodies providing those frontline services. Right. But the bodies, which were previously local government. the bodies for which central government has responsibility will see an increase. That's the breakdown of the 2015 yeah, but local government proposals. will actually see a, a decrease. Um, you also say that in the key messages, paragraph one, the Scottish budget has fallen 9% in real terms um, between 2009-10 and 2014-15. What has been, what, what is the figure for local government? Gordon may be able to put his finger on that figure. I'm sorry to put you on the I spot. Don't, I don't think I've got that figure with me. We have published those figures before, Convener, um, particularly in the Accounts Commission's Local Government Overview Report, so we can brief you on that, that after the helpful. meeting, if that would help. OK, thank you. Open it up. Yeah. Well, on that, yeah, certainly. Can I just, uh, it's an interesting area, because I think Hugh touches on one of the... The Convener touches on one of the areas about... You know, there's three big spending departments, obviously, there's local government, central government and health and it's how you it's a portion between these three in terms of the overall expenditure. Um, in terms of what's happened before uh, you may not have the figures available but again could you update us if you don't uh, in terms of what the reductions have previously been to central government departments compared with what has been previously happening to local government because that then gives us a fuller picture if that would be reasonable. Maybe, I'm not sure if you've got it available today. I think we have published it before in the previous yeah. reports to which this is a, a successor, but Gordon can give you more detail about that. Um, basically, basically, we don't have the information. The, the point of this report and to give these figures was to give an overall context for how things are without getting into the detail, but we've certainly got that available and we can get it to the yep. committee. And, and, and also, in terms of the, the um, in paragraph 24, the overall DEL budget for this group of bodies will increase by 147 million. I think it's true also to say that in that 147 million, 92 million will be for housing supply and 16 million for pensioners, uh, for police and firefighters' pensions. So there's some, well, that, the, the pensions bit's almost inescapable, um, but obviously there's been a decision taken to put extra money into housing in that regard. So, Mr. Crawford, that's um, what paragraph 24 sets out. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, I think when I read the report, I was actually looking for a report on progress in meeting the challenges. And um, 
Uh, although there's plenty of advice, I think, like the convener and Mr Crawford, I didn't actually get the sort of information that I was looking at uh, which public bodies were meeting the challenges or which public bodies should we be concerned about. So um, if I could just ask um, three fairly straightforward questions. Um, first of all, uh, the loss of 26,000 staff, but 10,000 staff went to Alios. Um, I know that, obviously, when you're with a, an arm's length uh, external organisation, we don't have any responsibility for the service. But is there anything more that you can tell us about the 10,000 staff that went there? Was it mainly providing local authority services? Do you feel that the local authority is ensuring good value for money and an effective uh, and competent, appropriate public service with the alios. Is, is there some check and balance you have there? I'll ask Gordon in a moment. There's no information the, about it. To ask the, answer the specifics on alios. It's an area that's been of interest to the committee over a long period. Yeah, we know. That. So we'll pick that up. You're right that the report doesn't focus on individual bodies. We no. tend to do that through either the sector specific reports on the NHS um, that you see every year or the reports on local government that the Accounts Commission publishes, which you're being briefed on, I think, in a couple of weeks' time. Mm. What we try to do here is to step back and look at the <coughs> bigger picture, um, and we hope that is of value to the public bodies. Gordon, could you pick up the Alio's question, yeah. please? Um, I think it's worthwhile, as Caroline's saying, when we're uh, painting the context for public finances, we refer to the staff reductions because there, there are re other references through the report. In terms of the specific question of the 10,000, uh, uh, the vast majority of these people will be involved in council-related services such as home care for older people. Uh, and the other big area, of course, is the leisure trusts that have been set up to deliver leisure services by councils. So the people are still involved in public services in that way, but through a different delivery model. Um, and the, uh, the committee has had an interest before. We're coming back in a couple of weeks with a local government overview report, which does refer to alios in quite a lot of detail. And there are some very important issues in there in terms of governance and how councils ensure that they not only um, the, the money they provide to alios is used properly, but they also get value for money from that, from that money. So our view would be, regardless of how that public pound spent, that there is value for money and that the money is used properly. So a paper is coming back to this committee with further details on alios. The, the, account, the Accounts Commission does an annual overview report, and okay. in two weeks' time we'll be here to give you a briefing on that report. In the background, Audit Scotland is doing some further work in alios. There's a lot of interest from, from yourselves and, 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 other, and other interested parties in alios because it's become such a large part of the local government landscape in recent years, mm -hmm. and there are a whole number of issues and concerns that people have. The alios themselves, of course, are operating in a uh, quite a demanding uh, financial uh, context themselves, mm -hmm. and as the um, you know, in terms of council's funding of these, it's important that we keep an eye on that particular landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like, sorry, just sorry. before you move on, uh, uh, can I ask you? You refer to um, home care services, um, and and also leisure. Services. I know in a number of authorities, um, leisure services were put into alios because there were tax benefits, um, particularly in relation to, to VAT. Is that the case with the home care services as well? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, convener. Um, certainly there's a whole range of factors will be taken into account. We'd like to, uh, and this is one of the areas we're looking at, is the decision-making process that councils, when they're looking at the options available, options appraisal is an important part of budget setting and decisions on how services are delivered, and the whole range of things to do with, uh, whether it's to do with VAT, non-domestic rates, but also to do with terms and conditions of employment and how assets have been used. There's a whole panoply of things that should be taken into account in that decision to make sure that the right decisions are, are made for services and the people that use the services. Okay, sorry, uh, my, my second question uh, really relates to Exhibit 2 on page 13. <coughs> in this committee in the past, we did uh, get figures on the backlog maintenance requirement for the NHS. Uh, and I appreciate that it falls into several categories, um, high priority, low priority, and uh, wished for in the future. Uh, but you've given uh, a figure here of £858 million. I think the last time it was over a billion, but it would be helpful. That, that figure doesn't really mean a lot unless it's saying this hospital is at the stage that there are health and safety issues. This is high priority. So, convener, I would find it helpful to get a, 
a little bit more background if you had it. But the second figure is probably one that I was not familiar with. You've given Scotland's local roads need repairs. A third of Scotland's local roads need repairs. Six per cent of these are categorised as high priority. Now, you know, is there a figure for six per cent? That six per cent doesn't really mean anything to me. What are we talking about in money terms? If it's a high priority, uh, I am aware that figures came out recently that motorists had been uh, paid compensation for local from local authorities uh, due to the portholes, etc. So it would seem to me rather than paying compensation, it would be better to invest the money in the roads. Uh, is there a figure for that? There are um, up-to-date figures on both of those, Ms Scanlon. They're, they're here for context to give an indication of the scale of the pressures facing the public yeah. finances as a whole. On the NHS maintenance backlog, you'll be seeing the updated figures in our report on the NHS financial performance due to be published in October, which will contain the usual detail by health board and by category of right. need. On um, the roads maintenance, the Accounts Commission published a report probably 12 months ago, I think, which did include the same sort of level of detail and very much made the point about the importance of investing now to avoid expenditure both on um, negligence claims and injury claims, yeah. but also on um, higher costs to put the roads back in the state they need to be in in future if they continue to deteriorate. Uh, uh, could be, okay, I wonder, can I ask, uh, what does 6% equate to in terms of a budget required to meet this high priority yeah. local road maintenance. How many millions is 6%? We can come back to you with that figure. It was published in the report on roads maintenance, and we can come back to you after the meeting with that. Okay. Um, I think I'll just leave it there. Okay, thank you. Um, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Jim. Um, Firstly, um, <coughs> I welcome the comment from the Auditor General in paragraph one that public bodies have coped well with budget reductions and have maintained services during what is a very challenging period. And uh, you know, that, that, that is to their credit. I wanted to look at a couple of things. One is uh, on page 13, Exhibit 2, under Financial. There is a comment at the bottom of that particular paragraph, but this is unlikely to be sustainable in the longer term. Is that uh, uh, an estimate by Audit Scotland, or is it based on feedback from uh, presumably this information came from your local auditors and so on. Both, Mr. Beatty. Um, what our auditors have done is to look at the approaches being taken by the 67 bodies we've looked at in detail here, um, and then applied our own judgment to it. And the sense is that um, pay freezes and recruitment freezes can be an important way of meeting the short-term shift in funding that was available. But over time, you're going to end up with perhaps not enough staff to provide services, staff in the wrong jobs because you don't control where vacancies arise and therefore where you're freezing recruitment, and public sector salaries can't be frozen relative to private such salaries indefinitely. Um, we've been through a, a number of years of pay freeze now. We're seeing recruitment challenges in a number of particular professions, and at some point I suspect there will need to be an adjustment so the pay freeze simply isn't sustainable. That's our audit judgment based on the evidence available to us about the costs of public sector pay. Okay. I'd like to move on to the question of uh, budgeting. And uh, you've made comments, for example, in paragraphs 34, 35, you're, you're encouraging uh, local authorities and local bodies to have budgets covering a five to ten year period. And again, on the previous page in paragraph 31, you're talking about uh, priority-based approach to budgeting. Is there not a danger in that? Um, if you look at paragraph 25, there's no indications beyond 2015-16 what might be the allocation of Scotland's budget. Therefore, the Scottish budget, the Scottish government can't really give any steer as to what sort of budget is going to come to local government in that period. So if local government use a priority-based uh, approach, they could easily end up uh, making assumptions that might be quite dangerous into the future because there might not be the funding there to meet what they consider their priorities are. Is, is, it, is it not a case that we're in a situation where short-term rolling budgets are really the order of the day because there isn't an alternative, however desirable a long-term budget might be? 
I think it's certainly the case that the further ahead you do your financial planning, the more uncertainty there is. There's no question about that. Um, the Scottish Government only knows its own allocations up to the financial year 2015-16. There are forecasts out there from different sources, more or less official, um, which are contested, as we all know. Um, but I don't think that's a reason for not looking at what the possible scenarios are and what options might be open to public bodies from the Government outwards um, for managing their services against the background of the outcomes that they have committed themselves to achieving. Um, clearly there are particular challenges at the moment given the, um, the <clears throat> constitutional question that's open just now and the different proposals that are on the table um, from different parties in that. That uncertainty is another layer of difficulty in doing it. But in our view, in some ways, it makes it all the more important to be thinking about um, the, the big challenges we face with an ageing population, um, with the challenges of providing health and social care to older people, of making a step change in the environment for children growing up in Scotland through the early years' priorities, um, to really think about how the finances could be used differently as we say in here, by looking at options for achieving the outcomes rather than just providing the services that would help us to get the best for the public money that is available. I also think it can be a very um, useful vehicle for engaging the public in different ways in those debates about the choices that will need to be made and the sort of public services we want to support um, Scotland after September, whatever the outcome of the referendum vote is. Because, again, in... Paragraph 38, you're talking about scenario planning as part of long-term financial strategies, and you know, that, that means making all sorts of different assumptions about possible income. I mean, there, there are a multiplicity of choices, and at the end of the day, if you've got a multiplicity of choices, which scenario are you actually going to base your, fu your future on? I think the bodies that do this well pick a, a limited number of scenarios um, based on uh, both the amount of uh, money they expect to have available to spend and features in the environment like the change in the population, um, the uh, uh, commitments that might be made for particular policy areas, and then work through a range of um, what might happen in each of those scenarios where the range of uncertainty gets bigger as time gets further out. Now, they're not the same as setting budgets, but they are useful ways of informing this year's budget setting and making sure the decisions being taken now don't make it more difficult to do what's required in the longer term rather than paving the way for the sorts of changes that are likely to be needed. I'm just a little bit concerned at the, the number of options you're opening up to councils and that here. I mean, you, you're talking about zero-based budgeting, you're talking about priority-based budgeting, you're talking about scenario planning, all based. There are some things that you've touched on there that can be validly quantified. You can say that there's going to be a population increase because of X, Y, Z. You can say that the number of elderly people are going to increase, therefore there's going to be pressures on that part of the budget. Mm -hmm. but, there's a, but the big uncertainty is the central budget. Nobody knows what that's going to be, except that it, that it's, it's, uh, it seems to be getting cut every year, and there's the prospect that it might continue beyond the next general election. And, you know, I just wonder the validity of a long-term financial strategy based on such a, a big uncertainty as to the major part of the funding. I think I'd say two things, Mr Beatty. The first is that we're not pr promoting any single tool here. Um, we're saying that budgeting should be linked to priorities and outcomes. We're not promoting zero-based budgeting or any of the other um, more formal approaches that have been um, piloted and, and promoted over the years. It's really much more saying, if this is what you want to achieve, how would you um, allocate your money to best um, increase your chances of achieving that. And secondly, we fully recognise all of the uncertainty that exists in the public finances and especially in Scotland at the moment. Um, but in our view, the benefits of doing some of that longer term planning while recognising that uncertainty outweigh the risks of simply saying it, it's all too hard and we can't think about it at this stage. There has to be that um, recognition of the uncertainty and of a number of possible um, scenarios for the future. But the process of thinking about what that might mean for public services in an individual body and across the range of public bodies in Scotland we think would have some real benefits. Is there not a danger that perhaps uh, the uh, local body might do uh, a long-term plan which takes into account their priorities and the perceived changes within their community and so on and make an assumption that the money might be there to, to meet it? 
I think we wouldn't see that as being good long-term financial planning. Um, there are, as I've said, some forecasts, forecasts that are available heading up to 2018-19 at the moment. Um, it is possible to do the planning on the basis of demographic changes further into the future than that. And those forecasts almost certainly won't be right, but they really do help to inform the process of, of making decisions now about where to invest and where to spend. I think it's a, a difficult subject at the moment. It is. Have you, Scott? Thank you. Can I just ask about your um, uh, expression in the key messages about there is limited evidence of longer-term financial planning? What is that limited evidence, Auditor General? Are you able to draw that out for the committee? Yes, maybe to give you one example that we've reported on here before, which is about long-term financial planning in the health service. Um, at the moment, all of the health boards are required to have medium-term financial plans, which are generally looking three years out. Um, when we've looked at them in detail, we found that most of those plans are only detailed for the first year forward, and they, they become much more high level after that. And then from three years onwards, there's really not very much that's publicly available, and auditors haven't seen very much evidence of robust plans planning with the sorts of um, challenges that Mr Beattie has been describing going out from there. And that broad example would be the case right across the public sector? Um, I'll, ask, I'll ask Gordon to talk a bit more about the nuance of what we found across these 67 mm. bodies, if I may. I think, I think that's the overall picture. Yeah. There's just, as we say, limited evidence. I think, going back to the previous question as well, I think the fact that some uh, organisations are making headway in this <laughs> is enough confidence that it can be done, mm. albeit taking a number of factors into account. But certainly across the sectors, there's, there's pretty limited, limited evidence of that longer-term planning beyond the kind of five- to ten-year timescale. Yeah, and, and Auditor-General, you said quite intriguingly earlier on that the constitutional question was part of that uncertainty. Would you like to expand on that? I'm not sure there's much I can say that, that's not um, very present to, to all of you as elected representatives here. Um, but we know, first of all, that the um, Scotland Act will bring um, more exactly. variability in yeah. Scotland's public finances with, with the tax-raising powers. Um, the uh, referendum question um, would give more flexibility again, um, both on tax and spend and potentially economic measures. And we're now seeing a range of other proposals coming through from the other parties, which would all have... Um, effects on both the spending yeah. and the income side of the equation. Absolutely. None of us knows what the no. effect of that so, will be. So you can hardly, blame, you can hardly blame quangos in the public sector for being pretty cautious at the moment until this thing in September is mm -hmm. decided. I think caution is entirely appropriate, Absolutely. and we're certainly not saying that all of these um, long-term financial plans should be in the public domain, but mm. the process of doing the planning, I think, does have a real value and can help to engage the public mm -hmm. in some of the difficult choices we face about not just meeting the financial challenges, but also um, producing better public services that may involve losses for some people yeah. of services that they value. Yeah, okay, but when I met a, quangle boss, a Scottish quangle boss last week, he said there was no financial planning going on in his organisation because he didn't what they'd be doing after September. You can hardly blame him for it. It's just the reality of that organisation. I'm not going to name him because that'll be him out of a job tomorrow if I do, but, uh, but that's the reality for the, for the state at the moment. I, I would disagree that, the, that no financial planning can happen. Um, it seems to me that um, the, the things that we're seeing, likely to see over the next few years, are moving within a, a range of possibilities, as we've discussed. Yeah. Um, but the uh, the, the basic services that most public bodies provide will continue to be needed. Absolutely. The challenges mm. that face them will continue, whatever happens. And I think there is value in the process of thinking now about what the scenarios might yeah. be and what options there are for meeting But there's very little evidence that's happening from your own evidence. That's what we found exactly. so far. Okay, thank you very much. I wanted to ask two specific questions. Um, the first is on the first bullet point in paragraph three of the report if at the end in which... Audits got in state, vacancy rates for NHS staff were increasing and boards were spending more on agency staff and on private sector providers. I, I personally know that's true, but I just wonder if there's any detail that, if not today, you could provide for the committee, because that's quite a significant finding that Audits Scotland have, have pointed to there. Uh, we have reported on um, staffing levels, vacancy rates and other staffing factors in the NHS previously in our annual report on the NHS financial performance. The next report in that series is due for publication in October and we'll provide again an update on the But does that position. bullet point, uh, no, that's, I'm grateful for that, does that bullet point point to an increase in use of private sector providers because that's how I'd re I read that sentence? It um, reflects what was uh, published in the report on NHS financial performance last autumn. Um, yeah. it's, it's not an update on that. No, We're still sure. in the process it's, of collating the view. most up-to-date yeah. information. Okay, that's fine. And the other one I wanted to ask was on page um, 
uh, was on uh, paragraph 20 in relation to the non-profit distribution uh, model. Uh, again, in the second bullet point here, it states uh, their effect is to create longer-term financial commitments and to reduce flexibility in how, to reduce, uh, in how future uh, revenue budgets can be used. Just in terms of Mr Smale's answer earlier on, will when um, the Accounts Commission report to us in a couple of weeks' time, will they pick up that particular point in, in respect of, in respect of uh, that finding that I've just quoted? I don't think there'll be very much more detail, but the point still stands. This is the point about just the, you know, having made decisions, and it ties back to the previous conversation about longer-term planning, the implications of taking decisions today, looking ahead yeah, to budgets and absolutely. lack of flexibility. So that, the, the basic point is reflected in there. We, don't, we won't be including any more details, but when we drill down into the local government side of things in the overview, that's, there is reference in there to the uh, implications for council budgets yeah. as part of that report, as you would expect. And uh, no, that's very fair. And, and specifically there on, on the Hubco model, which uh, I've seen it in my own local authority area, there's a huge uh, commitment being now put on local government under this model, it's called, you know, this is the new name for something that's been going on for a long time. Is that, when are we going to see some figures on that and actually how much profit some of these organisations are being made? Because I've seen the management fees that are being levied now on local government for these services. You'll recall from the reports we produced last autumn on both developing financial reporting in Scotland and um, infrastructure investment, that that question of um, both the transparency yeah. of uh, the revenue consequences of capital investment and the understanding of the financial sustainability are high priorities that we've recommended both government and public bodies should be focusing on. You'll get updates on that in various ways, but part of it will be included in, in our follow-up report on developing financial reporting later this year. Yeah. It's worth saying, I think, that, um, as we've said before, um, financing capital investment through revenue methods is entirely appropriate in some instances. We all do it when we buy a house on a mortgage, mm -hmm. but the, the question Questions of transparency and affordability, mm -hmm. sustainability are both the important oh, ones that should be I totally answered. agree with the principle of that. It's just the transparency doesn't exist at the moment. I find out more on this from talking to my local authority than I do from Parliament. I can't. I, mean, I'm, I just don't get answers on this in Parliament. So, we'll, when, when exactly will we get this transparency on? The um, follow-up that we're due to publish on the Scottish Government's financial reporting for the public sector as a whole is due before the end of this calendar yeah. year. Um, the the yeah, local government aspects of that will come through the Accounts Commission's work right. programme okay. in the future. Many thanks. Thank you. Uh, can just I ask a supplement? Well, 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 just before you do call, can, can I j just ask on this? Um, the non-profit distribution um, model which um, was mentioned What's the, the typical length of contract or project that will be, you know, where money will be paid to the private developer? I think there's a good deal of variation between different projects and different types of projects. Um, they tend to be long-term commitments because that's how you get the investment and the affordability in. Um, I don't want to um, make generalisations about it, but you will be seeing more in our reporting on investment. You're saying typically longer term. What are you talking about, 10, 15 years? It can be or 10 are you talking about 20, 25? It can be 10 years through to 25 or 30 in some cases, and that right. variation can be entirely appropriate. And the way that that works is the project is built, and for the next 25 to 30 years money will be paid to the, the private developer to run and maintain the facility, is that correct? In broad terms, yes. Um, in practice, the uh, details vary by projects. Um, right. Most of them now, I think, are focusing mainly on construction rather than on maintenance and service, the way some of the earlier um, arrangements, right. the earlier contracts were. It's just, it, it seems pretty familiar, the way that you're, you're describing it. But anyway, Colin? So it's uh, just a bit of clarification on the, one of Tavish Scott's uh, questions in terms of agency staff in the NHS. Would I not be correct in saying that the report said it was within the overall budget, it was a very, very low figure in terms of uh, the amount spent compared to um, other areas in the UK? I, I genuinely don't recall what we said about comparisons with the rest of the UK and given how sensitive this is at the moment I don't want to risk misleading the committee we can certainly report back to you with the figures we had in our last NHS financial performance report um, including any comparisons that we may have included I'm thinking in terms of the overall budget uh, it, it's not a huge amount of money considering the NHS in Scotland spends 
The spend on agency staff isn't a large proportion of the total budget or the staffing budget. The reason we focus on it is that agency staff particularly can bring risk to patient safety to the quality of care um, if the agency staff aren't properly familiar with the surroundings they're working in, with the hospital's um, processes for patient quality and safety, and they're generally recognised as being a less satisfactory alternative to bank staff or permanent staff. Okay. Right, thanks. Hey, Mike, Tosh. Uh, thank you. Uh, a number of, of areas. I have a question, uh, um, General, if I can. The first is efficiency savings. Um, previously, when we've talked about th this issue, the, the efficiency savings have been a mechanism used by local government and others uh, to address the cuts of budget. It's not really addressed in your report. Is that because it's not been happening or it's not successful, we can't measure it, or, or why? No, it's because I think, as um, Gordon said earlier, what we're trying to do here is something slightly different, which is to look at the um, underlying preparedness, um, mm. the progress that public bodies are, made, are making in meeting what looks as though, in any circumstances, will be continuing pressure on the public finances. And um, a lot of efficiency savings have been made. Some of the savings on staffing will fall into that category. Um, but in our view, they're not going to be um, sustainable for the long term if we're going to maintain uh, public services of the level that um, the uh, Scottish Government's committed to and to meet the challenges we know are coming with an ageing population and the other pressures we've referred to. So our focus is a bit different in this report. So you're suggesting that um, I mean, should, should efficiency savings still be at the heart of um, public bodies preparations, as it were? They're obviously still very important, and I think every public body um, should be doing what it can to identify where it can maintain the same level of service for less money or um, generally uh, make mm. better use of the money it's spending. Um, certainly Audit Scotland's doing that and many public bodies are doing it and we think that that's not sufficient in its set in it on its own there's that real need to be looking more fundamentally at what outcomes public bodies are trying to achieve what resources are likely to be available and to, to do the longer term financial planning about how to square that circle in the longer term but yes efficiency savings are still part of the mix there's just not enough in our view and it strikes me that most of the most of the savings you seem to identify most of the savings seem to come from either reductions in uh, staff or uh, restrictions on pay. Um, first of all, is, is that fair? And, and secondly, in paragraph three, you do flag up um, uh, in colleges, uh, there's an 11% reduction in, in revenue and uh, colleges aim to reduce staff numbers. And paragraph four, public bodies will likely to need to make further workforce changes. So are, are we going to expect further cuts in public sector workforce? I think that's a very difficult question to answer. We have focused on the workforce here and in the previous work on workforce planning mm. because staffing accounts for such a large part of public mm. sector budgets. There's no question about that. And they're central to thinking about changing the way services are provided. Um, we have uh, collectively produced work in the past on um, things like procurement. Uh, the Accounts Commission is doing some work on that at the moment. Mm. Um, the work on roads maintenance looked at the scope for getting savings out of the spend that we um, do on roads maintenance, so we're not ignoring those. Um, but staffing being such a large part of the budget and such a key part of the way most public services are provided, I think has been and will continue to be a focus for um, being able to rethink the way public services are provided to achieve the outcomes that are um, at the heart of government's national performance framework. Hmm. It, does it, I mean, you've identified 26,000 staff, more than 26,000 staff lost and 10,000 additionally transferred to Alios. Would it, would it not help to actually plan what further cuts are coming? Or is that? Is I think that? the 26,600 includes the 10,000 transferred to Alios, first of all. Yeah, um, and yeah. yes, absolutely. I think at the heart of our recommendations here is that continuing to make um, short term annual cuts in budgets um, mm. has been the focus so far. But we really do need to be making those longer term financial plans, recognising the uncertainty that Mr Beatty rightly highlighted, but thinking about what the options are for achieving the outcomes and providing the services that are needed. Mm. And that does mean a step back from the annual planning cycle. And, and finally, um, turn to an issue that uh, raised by uh, Mary Scanlon and, yeah. and my colleagues. Um, as well as the Scottish Government's increasing reliance on PFI uh, to defer costs, um, there's an issue with the um, rising backlog of maintenance. Now, I was reading back um, 
in 2011, the previous the predecessor report, uh, and, and your predecessor as Auditor General, he, he flagged up at the time, um, he said, uh, uh, talking about backlog of maintenance and repairs, he said, this is not just an accounting issue that we keep coming back to. In effect, what we are doing is using assets and depreciating their value. And quite frankly, some of them are getting past their usable condition. We are simply passing the problem on to future generations. It's an intergenerational transfer issue. And he, he, he gave some figures then. He said, uh, in the past, we've talked about a £2.25 billion pound bill to eliminate the defects on Scottish roads. Um, £1.4 billion to remove the backlog of maintenance and council owned assets. And £500 million on the NHS estate. And yours, so for the last of those, 500 million on the NHS estate, that's now risen to 858 million, according to your figures. So am I right in thinking that this backlog is rising? Are we tackling it all? Or are we actually just storing up future generational problems? I'll answer in general terms first before talking about the specific figures, um, and Gordon and Angela may want to chip in on those. In general terms, one of the reasons why we focus on the need to um, invest in and maintain public sector assets as one of the pressures is precisely because of that um, per perennial problem, that when finances are tight, it can be attractive to cut back on maintenance to keep frontline services running, um, and that can give you some short-term breathing space, but it's not a longer-term solution. We do need to make sure we're investing in the assets to make sure they remain fit for purpose and investing in new assets for new types of services. Um, you're talking later, later this morning about reshaping care for older people. That may well mean less reliance on beds in acute hospitals and more reliance on either different types of assets or different types of services. So again, that needs to be doing the longer term planning we think is very important. Um, I don't have the specific figures that you quoted there in front of me. Um, I do know that the um, NHS figures we report annually in the NHS Financial Performance Report, and I think the latest figures are showing a slight reduction. The Accounts Commission has been focusing on the roads maintenance budget, um, and we may be able to give you some more information about those. They tend to be based on periodic surveys, though, rather than information which is uh, readily reported in the accounts. And it's another reason why that transparency and clarity about what the need is, we think, is so important. Gordon, would you like to add anything to that? Um, I don't think so, other than we've tried to, in, in, in bringing this report together and give that context for public finances They've, and to use the most up-to-date public information available on the assets. For example, the, the uh, maintenance backlog for NHS comes from a, a report on the annual state of the NHS Scotland assets and facilities for 2013, published in December 13. So that's where that 858 figure comes from. As I said earlier, we don't have the roads figure available, but we'll be able to provide it uh, based on the last survey that was carried out and drawing that information forward. But I think it's worth reflecting on that overall context. That's just one of a number of things that are really important in terms of uh, going ahead and intergenerational, intergenerational issues about that, but also about some of the other things that are intergenerational about decisions on how to fund assets going ahead, uh, and not just about repairing them as well. Just to, to let you know, the figures I quoted came from the Auditor General in September 2011, giving evidence to this committee. Um, so it would be I have to say, very useful to know, particularly if the figures now are worse than they were then, or better, or you know, I think I think we'd all want to know in overall picture whether the backlog uh, across the public estate is uh, is deepening, um, and because I think I would think it was something that all all of us would wish to address. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kavira. Um, your report certainly is a stark reminder of the challenges facing. The public sector in Scotland, 9% real terms reduction, 910 to 1415, another 3.2 billion if the projection is correct, um, from 1617 to 1819. Um, and we already discussed that, understandably, in these circumstances, because staff costs make up usually about 75%, as I think what the sort of usual figure is in the public sector, that However, regrettable, that was an, an, an inevitable area that had to be looked at. We've heard from other members this morning about maintenance backlogs, public buildings, uh, roads, uh, creation of alleys, you know, there'll be grant reductions going on, there'll be closure of different facilities. Uh, and we have the public sector facing up to that challenge, um, and, and your report saying it pretty well. What worries me is, where do we go now? 
in terms of the scale of reduction that's going to be required between now and 2018-19. If all of these um, areas which have already been um, in staffing, you can go so far in staffing and eventually it's going to come to a situation where I imagine that organisations will need to decide we are no longer going to undertake a particular activity because otherwise you're always shaving, shaving, shaving. Um, so I'd just like a reflection on that. Where do you think, where do organisations go next given the scale of the challenge? And also, can you, if you could give me a view on what you think the Scottish Government's preventive approach, how it might be able to help address some of the challenges we're facing. I think there are probably two aspects of that I'd pull out. The first is that we try to say clearly in the report um, that really thinking quite rigorously about what are the priorities for each public body and for public services as a whole is key to helping to square that circle um, and making sure that we're making the right choices now for the longer term that we want to achieve. Um, and that may mean um, some tough choices about ceasing to provide some services rather than cutting them at the margins repeatedly, thinking quite radically about different ways of having them provided, perhaps linked to the community empowerment bill, to community planning and other policy drivers. That doesn't mean they're less tough, but it does mean there's a wider range of options available. <laughs> The second approach, I think, is the second point I'd make is linked to the government's outcomes approach and the national performance framework. Um, in broad terms, I'm, I think that's a very positive move. I think to focus on what you want to achieve rather than on public services as an end in themselves has to be a better way of guiding those long-term investment decisions. Um, but what we're seeing is that the financial planning that's happening in local public bodies isn't yet um, long-term enough to really help make the change that's needed in some areas. And I think the classic example is around reshaping care for older people, where we know that, um, first of all, practice varies a great deal across Scotland, um, but that there are still a lot of older people who are receiving care which is both um, not as good as it should be for them and more expensive than some of the alternatives might be if there aren't good alternatives to admission to acute hospital that would help them stay at home living good rewarding, independent lives for as long as they can. Um, so that question of really stepping back and looking as an individual body and with the, the partners you need to work with to think about that preventative approach in all of the areas where it's been a priority is what we think needs to be underpinned by the longer term financial planning. You can't move away from reliance on acute hospital beds to a, a range of community-based services overnight. The health service probably can't do it on its own. It needs to work with not just social care, but housing, the voluntary sector, and a range of others. And to do that, I think you do need to be thinking about what resources you're likely to have, what the number of older people is likely to be, what the pattern of care looks like in your area, to be able to start investing now to make that bigger change over the years ahead. Thank you. And in terms of local government, um, I just wonder what you've been able to find out about where local government have been a bit more imaginative in terms of joint services with their neighbour authorities, mm -hmm. the potential for savings that could be delivered there, um, rather than services being lost, actually, mm -hmm. and bringing services together that can give a scale that can help reduce costs, but at the same time keep service levels up. Yes. I know in my own area, uh, Stirling, where we've got them working quite closely with Clark Manning, in the social care area, and that's working quite effectively from what I can see. What, what experience have you seen from local authorities across Scotland to help drive that sort of change? Because uh, unless, if I was a, a, a local government manager now, looking at the scale of cuts being suggested by the UK government and up until 1819, I would be scratching my head and wondering where to go next. So that might be one potential area yeah. in joint service agreements to, to drive change. Local government doesn't sit within my responsibilities as Auditor General, but Gordon's our expert on local government for the Accounts Commission, so I'll ask him to pick it up if I may. Um, it's a big topic, and we could probably spend a long time talking about it, but I'll just highlight a few things. We've certainly been looking at the extent to which shared services has had an impact as a way of, of um, uh, delivering services in different ways and creating efficiencies. And I think over the years, as we brought overview reports, this committee is a constant, a, a fairly constant uh, story there about the large-scale projects, a lot of time and money being invested in them, but actually not a lot of evidence of success arising from them. And in fact, I think quite often it's the smaller scale, under the radar type of things, councils working together that have probably had most success. Um, interestingly, part of the Commission's work at the moment is uh, working with the Auditor General is in relation to community planning partnerships. 
And there's some interesting things uh, that we're identifying as part of these audits about the way in which particularly uh, the local council and the NHS and colleges, for example, are looking at new ways of working. I can think of a couple of examples off the top of my head where, for example, um, uh, looking at new ways between the council and the uh, local college where taking uh, young people out of a school environment into a college environment is having a huge difference in terms of their uh, overall attainment and their, their education. And I think that's uh, the, 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 the benefit of that joined up approach where organisations are coming together looking at different ways of delivering services which have got better outcomes for, for people in communities. I think in terms of the prevention agenda is another example where um, more work has been done involving councils and the NHS and looking at, uh, in early years, the types of ways they can work together to encourage uh, you know, young families to uh, take a different approach to bringing children through in, in, in areas of, of health improvement, for example. So I think there are lots of examples happening. I think the big set piece shared services things I'm not I don't think we'd be convinced there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that that necessarily works but I think I think I would encourage uh, looking more closely at the, the the smaller scale things and particularly the things that are happening when the boundaries of community planning partners as they look to work together and in the context of this report to bring it back to that to look at how um, budgets are used locally looking at the overall uh, money that's available in a community planning area rather than looking at individual budgets, what's available to us. I don't underestimate the challenges in, in achieving that. And I think as is well mentioning, if we've been talking about public money here, but it's beyond that, the resources elements beyond that. How can uh, the public sector in areas working together make better use of assets such as buildings or indeed staff for that matter as well? So I think there's a lot happening. I think there's a long way to go. But that's why we're encouraging as part of this process to link it all together uh, looking more at outcomes and how partners can work together uh, with a shared view of what the outcomes are for the area and then to take that uh, almost like a leap, leap of faith to start having a more um, a rounder conversation about the uh, resources available in the area for providing services in different ways. And that's useful. It seems to me though from what my experience has been that one of the key blockages to that level of change is, you know, is actually being prepared to surrender your budget line to to another organisation or share it. How do we get organisations to recognise that if we're going to get that level of step change that's required, that actually they're going to have to surrender some of that budget line either to a new organisation which is jointly formed or a different organisation to deliver? Because that seems to be where the biggest blockage is in terms of getting the partnership to actually work. I think, as Gordon said, that's right at the heart of the work we've been doing on, on auditing community planning partnerships. Um, that uh, We reported on that at the back end of last year um, and found that um, there's been lots of work on the processes and structures for community planning, not much evidence so far of really, as you say, shifting where the money's spent, who spends it, what it's spent on, by focusing on the outcomes. Um, and there's something very important about, first of all, building the trust, which we hope that sort of process and structures will have built, uh, worked towards, but then being much more transparent across the partners about what, what money spent, what it currently achieves, what the challenges are for the future here in this area. Um, we've got five more community planning partnership audits underway at the moment that we'll be reporting on at the back end of 2014. Um, and we're hoping we'll have some evidence of where that's working. But as you say, it, it's a difficult thing for organisations to do and something that will be very important in this context given the continuing challenges. Do you want to add to that, Gordon? Um, other than to just uh, emphasise, we, we recognise it's not easy to do. I think it's been given quite a lot more leverage as well. If we look at the agreement in joint working and community planning and resourcing that COSLA and government signed uh, back in September last year, we certainly know from the community planning work that that is, um, if you like, in some ways forcing the issue locally. But I wouldn't underestimate the challenges. I mean, if I think of the one that I was recently involved in, um, you know, you've got councils, for example, setting budgets on the basis of uh, departmental and services, whereas health boards may be working on the basis of geographic areas, for example, in Fourth Valley. So, you know, there's things. But I think there's, a, um, there's an imperative now, perhaps, that wasn't there in the past. Yeah, we moved a bit quicker. Can I remember? When did and you remember this is all the convener when the Pathfinder authorities for partnership were set up in the 1990s. And at that stage, it was recognised that that was the big challenge mm. in terms of getting them to shift their budgets. And not really, not as much as improved or moved on as I would have liked. Sorry, can you just issue on capital? 
Um, from your report, you, you tell us that we have seen a 29 per cent reduction in capital 910 to 1415, and, and there are obvious consequences for the economy in regard to what we are able to spend in general construction of um, public buildings or public works. But we, we do not have a projection, as we, as we have for the Dell budget, in what might be coming by way of further reductions in capital. Is that available? Gordon, do you know what we have got? C can we check it and come back to you, Mr Crawford? I don't want to mislead you. No, that there are different um, levels of detail available for the different lengths of projection. So we'll check that and come back to you if that useful. would be helpful. I mean, yes. Set it in context alongside the Dell budget, given the scale of reduction there. Can I just tiny, smaller thing, if you don't mind, going back to Colin Beattie's points about mm. long-term planning and using projections which you have very usefully provided to us. If a local authority, for instance, was to take some of that projection and begin to build plans around it, uh, whilst I recognise fully that they have got to be involved in a longer-term financial planning process, I do have some concern that they start taking irrevocable decisions now based on projections of spend that they are not very sure are going to happen mm -hmm. and may take decisions that, re that um, reduce a, a service in a particular area that actually does not come to pass in the longer term. So, uh, so it is that balance, I think, that Colin mm -hmm. was talking about without making the, a decision that is irrevocable early on yes. that can cause you know, significant harm um, further mm -hmm. down the line. I, th I think the challenge is that there is no risk-free option in this, that there's clearly uncertainty, no question about it, whoever's forecast you believe and however um, long you're prepared to, um, to, to look at them, whatever longer periods you focus on. Um, you talked about the risk of cutting services unnecessarily, and there is a risk of that. Equally, there's a risk of um, recruiting staff or investing in assets that will have longer-term consequences. Um, making staff redundant, as well as being very bad for the individuals affected, does have a cost. Um, almost any investment in buildings and services will have things that are locked in for the long term. So what we're focusing on is not um, pretending that there is certainty where there isn't, but encouraging people to go through the process of thinking about what's most likely to happen, what options they've got available in their own organisation, and by thinking more widely with their partners and with their local community and voluntary sector partners. Thank you for your patience, Camina. Mr Smale, you mentioned an example of good practice of um, school pupils going into college. Uh, where, where is that happening? Um, it is uh, in Falkirk. We, Falkirk. we published the Falkirk Community Planning Audit Report at the end of May, so that is a public document. And I think we highlight in there as, as, uh, as a, an example of um, how partners working together to tackle problems or to look at new ways of doing things have uh, worked. Okay, thank you. Um, Willie Coffey? Um, Auditor General, you, you've told us or reminded us in your report that uh, the Scottish budget has been has already been cut by about three billion pounds to date, and and for me the the key paragraph in your report is paragraph twenty five that tells us if if things stay the same after this thing in September that Davy Scott referred to, Scotland can look forward to a further budget cut of potentially three, three point two billion pounds. Is that is that correct? That figure. Um, the figures that we have in here are extrapolating the OBR forecast to 2018-19 into the Scottish budget for the, for those three years beyond 15-16. So if things stay the same after the thing in September, we could be looking at a further three point two billion pounds worth of cuts to the Scottish budget. I mean that's pretty big writing in anybody's wall, would you expect public sector managers, wherever they are in Scotland, to be to be sitting on their hands talking about uncertainty, given a potential scenario like that, and should they be planning for that possible eventuality? I think the key words in your question were the words could be. These are forecasts, and we know that forecasts are only that. They're not um, descriptions of the future. They're an investigation of the future. 
Um, we also know that over and above these figures, there's the uncertainty we referred to further about the outcome of the referendum and either independence or the potential for further devolution. And we have the um, implementation of the Scotland Act starting next April that will give some tax raising powers to the Parliament. But in general terms, I agree with you absolutely. The reason for making our recommendation is that we think all public sector leaders and managers should be going through the process of thinking what might happen, not just to the budget, but also to demand for their services and different ways of meeting that demand and achieving the outcomes that we're committed to as a, as a country. Yeah, thanks for that. In terms of um, good practice around Scotland, and Bruce Crawford led us along that road to that discussion. You've, you've cited a couple of good examples, I think, Edinburgh and Fife, where some good work has been taking place and some savings have been achieved. I can add to that a convener from my own authority in East Ayrshire who have, have uh, merged the <coughs> road service department with South Ayrshire Council and are hoping to save about £8 million or so over a period of 10 years. Now, we could argue, convener, that that could happen. That, that work could have happened anyway. Or was it really driven by this cuts agenda? But you could argue on either side of that. But nevertheless, it is taking place and, and it seems to be paying some early dividends for us in Ayrshire. Do you, your checklist that you referred to in your report, are you finding that the local authorities are embracing that and using that to achieve these kinds of partnership uh, relationships and these kinds of financial gains that we, we clearly have to, to make over the coming years? One of the great things about our work is that we do come across examples of good practice and real improvement all over the place in everything we do, and we try to reflect that in our work. We have made that move that you've referred to now of producing more guidance, checklists and other things for all public bodies to use, not just councils. Probably too early to say whether the ones that accompany this report are being used yet, but our local auditors do follow that up. And as part of our thinking in Audit Scotland about the um, future direction for public audit, I think we're recognising the scope for us to do more to help people learn from the good practice that we identify. So it's something we take very seriously. Gordon may be able to tell you a bit more about the way previous checklists have been used and what we know about that. Yes, we published this report just uh, last Thursday and the checklists were published alongside they're on our website if, 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 if you want to look at them. Um, I think this, we, we had a long discussion internally about what you call these things, checklists, because on the one hand we don't want people just simply to go down and think yes, no, that type of thing. But we're, we've put a wee bit of uh, context in front of the checklist. And what we're looking for is for people, to, for uh, councillors and non-executive directors to look to have that conversation within their organisation. So it's not just about running down what, do, what is my responsibility, but what's actually happening in the organisation. So we're saying, encouraging people in the, they've got a key role in this to ask themselves these questions, but also to have the discussions internally and actually putting some onus as well on them to, if they don't know the answers, to go and find out, to ask. And if you look at the council one, for example, we're again flagging the key role that the proper officer for finance, the Section 95 officer, has, has in councils. So trying to encourage that dialogue. So it's not just about yes, no, but what evidence do I have as somebody that's got a key role in this? And where do I go to if I need more uh, information? And alongside that, just the, you know, the usual comments that we make, which are absolutely vital in areas like this, which are quite complex areas, to look at the training that's available. But I think, again, if I could uh, take that stage further, it's not just about the availability of the training, it's the take-up as well. Because when we look at what's available, there's quite a lot of information available, quite a lot of training available. But it's back to that, uh, amongst the very busy life that councillors and non-exec directors have, to find time to take up that training so that they're better informed to ask the right questions uh, in, in, in these areas. I mean, I can recall convener being a, a local councillor. Not, not uh, too many years ago being part of the scrutiny process where your own staff were looking at the local authority and, and that experience was a really enriching one for local councillors and officials to, to engage with but I'm always hoping that we'll see some kind of feedback to us at the, the audit committee through your reports of how local authorities are or are not adopting your recommendations that was always a comment here from one of your predecessors convener George Fuchs who always said the reports are great, what happens next? And how do we get some feedback in the future about you, how your recommendations are being implemented? So any future reports coming to us on this subject, I would love to see your assessment of how local authorities are, are taking up your recommendations or, or not. 
that back to the Accounts Commission, Mr Coffey. I know they take it very seriously as well, and we do follow up all of our audit recommendations through the local, local audit process. Um, we'll have a chat about whether that can be made more transparent to you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I'd just like to go back to the public sector workforce reduction. I mean, we talk about the figure being 26,000, and it's been accepted that 10,000 of that are uh, people who have been transferred to Alios. Would that not mean then that really the reduction in the workforce that deals with the, what was public sector uh, tasks is really it's, a, it's more like a four and a half percent cut than a seven percent cut? I understand why you have to report it as it is, but should there not be something in there that kind of puts it in context? That, because it suggests, for example, that that you know there's been a seven percent cut in workforce to deal with the issues that the the local authority families deal with which in many cases has, has already been spoken about. It's been sort of like sporting venues and the, or the health venues, sorry, uh, and the home care, which are still being dealt with. Mm -hmm. They've just been dealt with with a different part of the, the family. Is there some way that we can, mm -hmm. we, we can report that clearly? I think we have made that clear in paragraph 26. We've included both the 26,600 and the 10,000 within that of people who were um, transferred to alios of various sorts. We also say in the final sentence that, um, the final couple of sentences, that they're um, still providing public services and there will likely be some cost to the public purse in doing that in different ways. One of the challenges, though, as this committee has focused on a number of times, is that what happens in Alios isn't as transparent as what happens in the rest of public services for a whole range of reasons. Um, there are likely to be different um, terms and conditions, but also different ways of working um, and change over time from the point of transfer, which we don't have good information on. So we try to be as clear as we can about what's happened, but there is less information available to us about what's happening in Alios than in the public bodies that we audit directly. That's fair. I think that's a fair comment. As I said earlier, it's an area that we've got a close interest in, and certainly the Accounts Commission oversees uh, the local government work um, as a really keen interest in this challenging Audit Scotland to look uh, more closely at that, and we're actually doing some work on that um, right, as, right as we speak, actually. Yeah, I completely understand the, the difficulty you have in, in reporting it and the, the lack of transparency around about it. I'd like to go on to an, another a couple of small matters. One has just been touched on about Willie Coffey, and you, you talked about training for councillors in particular, non-executive directors. Is there a, are there any best practice, any councils that are doing a particularly good job in making sure that the councillors that go on, because like Willie, I, I, was, I was previously a councillor, like others, I was previously a councillor, and I know of councillors that, including myself, that, that went on to committees, but wouldn't really have had that full range of knowledge or experience that, that uh, probably was appropriate for, for a scrutiny committee such as that. So that you'll be taking evidence from the Accounts Commission in a couple of weeks' time on its local government overview report. And one of their continuing interests has been exactly that question of what training is provided and what's taken up, not just for financial management and scrutiny, but for a whole range of other um, important parts of their role. So if, if you're content, um, I prefer to leave that for the Commission to answer than to try and step in myself. Yeah, that makes sense. And the, the last point I'd like to raise is you talk about a... In paragraph 48 and page 21, you talk about benchmarking and the importance of benchmarking and that it's common across the Scottish public sector, but that for central government NHS bodies, there were few examples of measurable benefits derived from benchmarking activities, but in local government you found that there were examples. Was there a particular reason for that? And if there are, are there lessons that we can take from that that we could then extrapolate onto the bodies are finding it more difficult. I think there are two things that I'd say, and then perhaps invite Angela to comment if, she, if she'd welcome doing that. Maybe Gordon. <laughs> um, the, the first is that uh, we know that in local government, Cosler and Solis have put a lot of effort into their benchmarking initiative. After a number of years when the Commission was saying much the same thing, that there was lots of activity but not much evidence of it being used in practice and changing the way services are provided, and the Commission's sense, I think, is that that has really shifted. The second point I'd make is that actually it can sometimes be difficult for um, councils and other public bodies to really demonstrate what has changed as a result of benchmarking, even if there's lots of activity going on. In a sense, it's related to the question that Mr McIntosh asked earlier about efficiency savings, um, that uh, we're often told that people have achieved efficiencies, but when you ask them to demonstrate how that's been done, that sort of audit trail is not always as clear as we'd like it to be. Gordon, do you want to add to that on the local government front? Um, 
I don't think there's very much more to say. I think I think what we are um, pleased to see is that that uh, the, the, the framework that Caroline mentioned there is up and running and is pretty much established and is being you know um, is there for for councils to use. I think our challenge is to start using that material more. Uh, to use it in, uh, in, the, in the context of what we're talking about today in budget settings as part of that overall information that's available to councillors um, in looking at budgets. Um, but also, I think importantly, we make, uh, you know, we, we make quite a few references in here to options appraisal so that benchmarking information is part of that overall package of things that's available to elected members when they have to take these difficult decisions and look at the options that are being presented to them. How are we comparing with other councils? Why is it that our unit cost for such and such a service may be higher or lower than a, a, a comparable authority? All of this is about, um, you know, that phrase about a, a can opener, something that allows people to start asking informed questions about services, uh, how good, bad or indifferent they are in terms of their quality, but also in relating to some of the inputs around costs. And I think that's the real benefit. So in summary, it's about um, a, a framework that's here in local government, but just starting to apply that more in uh, both in budget setting and that matter, and for that matter, in scrutiny of, of outturn, what's actually achieved from public money. Okay, thank you. Sorry, were you going to come in, Angela? No, uh, no I've got noth nothing else to add to that. Can I just add then, I mean, uh, the General, you said that uh, the local authorities as well as the others were struggling to, to highlight what benefits benchmarks gave them really, I mean, how they can prove that, although they say that the benchmarks are working, but they, they can't really show the benefit of that. If that's the case, then what is the point of it? Um, I, I think what, what I was trying to say is what it says in the middle of paragraph 48 about auditors not finding very much um, evidence of demonstrable benefits coming from the benchmarking. Um, I'd agree wholeheartedly with what Gordon said about the information being a really important tool, both for the managers responsible for a service and for the councillors or the non-executive directors responsible for overseeing their performance and for making the longer term decisions about where to spend public money. It's great information for saying why are we more expensive than the the other councils or the other health boards in this area, drilling down and saying, is that because our costs are higher or because we're doing more of it, thinking about what it might mean for doing things better in future. It's really powerful information. What we're not seeing at the moment is good evidence of that audit trail that it's being used in that way to, to really produce measurable savings or improvements in quality. Can I just very quickly and I just mm -hmm. take you back to the, the very first, first question I asked then is why, I mean, I accept that Cosla and Solis have, have done a lot of work on it, but why are the other departments uh, not getting the same success as the local authorities seem to be? I think the investment that local government made was significant and um, it took a lot of time to get off the ground. I think you'll hear more about that from the Accounts Commission and I think people in local government involved in it would say that there was a real investment needed to, to start having that impact. Um, we haven't seen the same focus in the other sectors, although there is some limited benchmarking that has gone on for particular types of services, particularly central services. What we're focusing on here, though, is the way in which that benchmarking is actually being used to make real changes um, and improve efficiency or improve quality. Could it have anything to do with the size of the organisations, but local authorities are kind of smaller and more manageable than... I'm not sure that we've got any evidence to suggest that's the case. There clearly are some very big local authorities um, in Scotland, as well as some very small ones, and the same is true for health boards, for example, is the obvious comparator. Okay, right. Yeah. Thanks very much. I just ask a question that um, was raised about um, the workforce. Y you've looked at the reductions in local authority mm. uh, workforce, and you, you say that, um, I think it was, was 10,000 staff were transferred across to Alios. Have you looked at how staffing levels in Alios have gone over um, the number of years? Because is there any guarantee that those who transferred across or the numbers who transferred across would still be employed or had, has there been reductions there as well? In terms of what we know at the moment, we don't know that. As I was saying to um, another member of the committee earlier, one of the challenges about Alios is that it's, what's happening isn't as transparent as it is for public bodies. Angela can tell you more about the work we're currently doing on Alios and how far that might help to answer those questions. Yeah, if, um, convener, if you remember when we brought the, the workforce report to the committee in December, we had quite a lot of discussion around Alios and the, the 10,000 staff that had transferred to them. Of those... Um, just over 9,000 had transferred from local government um, to Alios, and the rest were from 
health and central government bodies and to private sector providers still providing public services though um, and, and we made that point at the time. The, the work that we're doing just now on Alio is the the, we, the Commission uh, has asked the auditors of all 32 councils to gather some baseline information um, for this current year or the current audit year, which is 13-14. Uh, and we want to know how many alios exist uh, because we don't even know that at the moment. There are, there are uh, is growing. What, what they're like and what they do, uh, how much money they spend and what councils' governance arrangements are for those alios. That will then give us some good information um, to, um, to inform the Commission on what they want to do next. And there may be um, a series of reports on ALIOs. We may want to delve into them a bit deeper uh, and look at that information. Information will be coming through over the summer, and by the time we get to the end of the year, we should be in a very good position to um, see what we're going to do next with that. OK, thank you very much for that. Can I thank you all for contributing to a very full discussion, and it's clearly one uh, to which we will uh, return, uh, not least of which uh, when we, we get the report from the Accounts Commission. So thank you very much for, for that. Um, item three, uh, committee members have responses from HM Revenue and Customs, the National Audit Office, um, the Scottish Government and the Auditor General to the committee's report on the framework for auditing the Scottish rate of income tax. Uh, do you have any comments, questions? Colin? Just a sort of general comment that uh, there's still an awful lot of gaps in this. And, uh, you know, on, on page four, for example, that second paragraph where it says details of the enforcement and compliance regime are being developed further by HMRC, I think we need to come back to this because there's, a, there's gaps here in, in the assurances that we're getting. There's questions about how effective the involvement of Audit Scotland would be and how it could perhaps be made more uh, effective. Uh, I, think that, I think there's still a lot of exploring to do to ensure that this committee is properly involved in the process. Uh, I still see some gaps there. and we need, to, we need to really come back, I would think. I don't know, maybe in a, it could be a year's time because this, this is yeah. a couple of years off. No, um, yeah, well, you know that um, the, the, the NAO and HMRC first annual audit reports will be considered by the committee in mid-2015. In the summer 2015, um, the first NAO report on the implementation of Scottish rate of income tax will be laid in the Scottish Parliament. So I think that will give us the opportunity to come back and consider in more detail. It's whether there's anything committee members want to do at the moment other than not... Yeah. No, it was a similar uh, comment. Um, the, uh, it was really also just question in the government's response, um, which is all, uh, which is fine, except that there's, uh, it's lacking in details. So it was really just to find out. I don't understand whether or not we would get any of the detail before next year. For example, the very last um, on page six of John Sonny's reply. Um, there's a, he responds, this is about um, uh, confirmation about um, use of the cash reserve included within the annual budget documents. And he says, we can confirm that the principle of these recommendations will be accommodated and that the practical arrangements for doing so are currently being discussed. So it's things like that. I really want to know, you know, the practical arrangements are actually what we want to know. Uh, I mean, I'm pleased he agrees with the principle, but uh, it's whether or not we will get this before um, the report itself in summer 2015, so I'd have thought we would have wanted to. Well, can, can we ask if there's any, can I ask the Scottish Government if there's any uh, plans to provide uh, more detail ahead of that? And uh, as, as the report suggests, we will have the opportunity to come back to this next year. Yes. Well, I just on that, though, the, the very first point, which was, our, our question was uh, a clarification of how the, the Scottish Government intends to assess the effectiveness of compliance activities. Um, just my, my thought on that, it, clearly it, it matters to them as much as it does to us, but it, uh, they're not going to do anything else other than just you know, ask them, monitor them and rely on uh, the, audit, uh, the National Audit Office as far as I can see. Um, I don't, wouldn't mind clarifying that. They're not, they're not commissioning any other work. Um, they're effectively relying on, on ongoing relations with the HMRC and uh, between government officials. 
Yes, except that not only the Scottish Government, but ourselves will have the opportunity to look in more detail next year um, when the reports are, are laid. You know, as part of those questions, we can ask what ongoing work um, is being done. But I think next year uh, will be the key stage yeah, ahead of implementation in 2016. Mm. Okay. So, with you know the, the further clarification to be sought from the Scottish Government, can we agree to note that report? Okay. okay thank you. Um, item four, um, section 23 report, accident and emergency performance. Um, we have a, we've got correspondence from both Scottish Government and Audit Scotland uh, to the report. Any comments from committee members? Tabby Scott. Can I just ask a question about the future, if I may, on the Woody Coffee's very fair observation about what we do to make sure these things come back and we properly assess them in the future. Um, there's a particular recommendation which Paul Gray and his correspondence deals with very sensibly and constructively on ensuring boards have access to benchmark information on staffing levels. Yesterday, um, Health Improvement Scotland were called in to look at uh, the uh, Forrester Hill, uh, Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. Now, for my part of the world, that's a massive issue, and I'm very pleased Health Improvement Scotland are going to be involved in that. But what worried me most, convened on that one, was it was staff uh, directly approaching central government, who then taken, in my view, a sensible decision to have that inquiry or have that uh, report, rather than it going through Grampian Health Board. And as the Auditor General and others we hear in front of us all the time, but they're always on us, uh, at us about governance. Well, clearly something went wrong there. Can I just ask, Camila, that in the future, I'm not, of course, expecting this to be done uh, today because this is a retrospective report, but in the future we might see that kind of assessment coming back and Grampian Health Board being part of a case study which was properly assessed and that at some stage or, that our committee may have a chance to, to look at that again after the event, clearly once um, all these reports have been done. But, uh, sorry, well, it was actually on Paul Gray's response, which uh, I, I thought was very effective. I thought it was uh, pretty thorough, and it certainly addressed many of the concerns the committee raised. But <clears throat> I was also drawn to uh, the benchmarking information, and in particular his uh, commitment to working with NHS and Scottish Government to ensure relevant information is available so boards can make informed decisions on staffing levels and skill mix in A&E. And that was basically what we had at the weekend from uh, Grampian. So uh, I just wondered, um, Convener, if we could consider taking further oral evidence on this, A, given the concerns that have arisen over the weekend, uh, but also that Paul Gray has committed to uh, bringing forward further data in September and I think given our timetable over the next few months if we were taking oral evidence uh, it would potentially be about October anyway and that could fit in very well uh, with, a, uh, with our uh, working pattern. I think that would be helpful information because it does tend to highlight the problems in Aberdeen. Okay, can Martin first? <laughs> Uh, yes, I, I was actually. I also thought it was a helpful response. Although the, 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 it was the reply on uh, effective hospital discharge processes, which I wasn't entirely sure about, um, because he was saying it's agreed, but then he and he was saying that they've already got. We saying all hospitals have discharge processes. Mm. And then he talked about a new model, so I wasn't quite sure. Um, you know, if they've got discharge processes, then really we're asking, well, they've not been working. So um, what's changed here? So I really, I, I just wanted to explore. Um, well, the, the, the question then would be, do we note or do we seek to invite further evidence? Well, like Mary, I, I think it would be welcome. I mean, it's, I think it's October, okay. November. Can we agree but, that do we seek further evidence on this? Yeah. And uh, can we agree to um, let the clerk come forward with some suggestions to us about witnesses? I wonder. Sorry, I, I, thought we were just, I, I thought we were just going to take well, you know, mention has been made. Tavi Scott has made mention of Grampian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it would be useful if we could find out what is going on there, and there may be other areas. You know, as well as Paul Gray making a contribution, I think we need to find out from those on the, the front line. Okay. Could you just be helpful? I'm not asking uh, to, helpful to James. I'm not asking for us to do work prior to the Health Improvement Scotland report, because that's clearly the right way to, for that to yeah. proceed. And I, but what I answered from the, from the um, statement by Grampian Health Board yesterday is that's due to finish this summer anyway, to be yeah. done this summer for obvious reasons. So I think if we were looking at October, that would seem entirely sensible. I agree that we should have 
evidence taken on this. I think it's right, as Mary suggested, we should wait till after the September so yeah. we can get an update on where we, on where we, where we currently are. There are two issues really going on here, though. There's the overall issue about accident emergency, which obviously um, Paul Gray would be very useful to come along and speak to us about where we've reached at that stage. And there's quite rightly Tavish's issue specifically around Grampy. And I just wonder, should we treat these as two different streams in terms of the way we deal with evidence? Because there's obviously a specific thing going on in Grampy and well, to allow us to bore down yeah, on it. Except that there could be others, like, for example, in, in uh, my own area. Um, the REH in Paisley has consistently been amongst the, uh, the, one of the two worst hospitals in Scotland, um, and you know we can't get to the, the bottom of that. So I think it would be useful to, to find out um, from these health boards, you know, why are there problems with uh, accident and emergency in some areas, which are significantly worse than others, because others are, are actually doing pretty well. well maybe that's the Key to this, then, community, isn't it? Because Tayside are the place that seems to be, be the place that's doing yeah, well, yeah, and maybe we, we should be hearing yes, from Tayside about, no, exactly. about what they're doing differently. Totally. Yeah, I think that's, exactly no, I think right. that's, a, that's yeah. a sensible idea. Because I, th I think, you know, the point has been made on a number of occasions that, you know, we shouldn't just dwell mm -hmm. on the problems, right. we should look at the examples of good practice. So I think it would be useful, yeah. the agreement of the committee, let's get those in who are doing it well. And let's hear from those that seem to be struggling, and we can also hear from Paul Gray. Is that agreed? I wasn't against the idea of the report that they found no, no. evidence that was justified. Yeah. I was confused. I thought that we were yeah. talking about getting Paul no, no, Gray in from both of the previous. Is that, that agreed? Yeah. Uh, yes, correct. Who do we agree? It's just, I'm new to this. So who do we agree specifically who, as a committee, specifically who's well, getting invited? I will ask the, I'll ask the clerk to the committee to circulate some suggestions, having listened to this discussion, and then the committee can, can decide. I think, from well, my take in, we've agreed that at some point Paul Gray should be invited to make a contribution. Your suggestion is that we should look at Tayside. Um, I, I'll talk to the clerk to consider whether, for example, Greater Glasgow, because of the problems uh, at the REH, um, and then there are issues in, in Grampian. Can, can I just make one other suggestion in terms of looking at that pool? One of the points I raised with the other general when we had this discussion about the report was the correlation between 999 calls and the A&E poor performance. So when we're looking at that pool of people we want to talk to, can we make sure that at least we've got one of these organisations in that has high 999s but not doing so well in A&E overall? I think Edinburgh right. is probably... Okay. The, the, the yep, that's a useful suggestion. Okay, thanks very much for that. And with that, uh, we will move now into private session and we'll take a break.